unsolved problems come and go. They're posed and they get solved. It was once thought that it was impossible to fill a big square with a whole bunch of little squares of different sizes. But then solutions like this started popping up in Cambridge in the 1930s. We're going to look at 13 problems that are still unsolved, one for each grade, K through 12. And we're going to try to get a million dollar reward for each one, the prize to be split between the mathematician who solves the problem and the most inspirational K through 12 teacher. Why should we use unsolved problems in the K through 12 classroom? First and most important, because they engage a wide spectrum of student ability. Second, because they enlighten teachers and students about the edge of knowledge. It's like going on a hike and discovering a precipice and climbing up to the edge and peering over. These problems have the ability to thrill. The last reason to use unsolved problems is to extinguish math phobia. Now you might think that phobics become more and more scared as problems get tougher and tougher and tougher, but I don't think that's true. Phobics are scared of failure, but with extremely tough problems, as the expectation of success plummets to zero, the teacher can say, you've got no chance of solving this problem. Why not just tinker? And that opens the window of opportunity for the student to realize that everyone is in the same boat with this problem. Teachers are going to fail, mathematicians are going to fail, and most importantly, their peers are all going to fail. Unsolved problems extinguish math phobia by removing the stigma of failure and replacing it with curiosity. 13 unsolved problems starting at kindergarten. What unsolved problem of mathematics could kindergarten students possibly understand? Well, whenever they're cleaning up, they're putting away blocks into boxes and paintbrushes into jars and crayons into cups. How many crayons can fit in this cup? That's not an easy question. And in general, these packing problems are extremely difficult and unsolved. The one that we're going to look at is from 1975, and it's by Paul Erdős, the most published mathematician in history. He asked, how big a square do I need in order to hold nine little squares? Oh, that's easy. Well, how big a square to hold ten little squares? Hmm, that's not as easy. But this is the best you can do. How big a square do you need to hold 11 little squares? Hmm, this is the best I could do, but somebody did better than me. You can imagine that these are extremely tough problems. We don't even know if this is the best possible for 11 little squares. Can you imagine how tough it is to find out the solution for 55? Well, this is the best we've found so far, but there's no guarantee that that's the best possible. I don't want you to go out and buy little squares for your kindergarten class. Instead, every time your class is engaged in cleanup, remember these packing problems. Cleanup time is math time. The grade one problem was posed in 1917 by Henry Dudeney. It's a problem rich in pattern, and all grade one teachers love pattern. Here it is. You've got a 10 by 10 grid, and you have to add 20 towers to your grid. But no three of those towers can be on the same line. Have I succeeded here? No, first of all, I don't have 20 towers. But have I succeeded in not having three in the same line? No, I've also failed there. Look at this. I've got three in a line on the right and three in a line on the bottom. Hmm. This is possible, however. Here is another solution. And here's another one, and another one. This is well beyond my expectations for grade one to solve this size of problem. So we're going to shrink it down to a four by four problem. And here the students have to place eight towers. And they have to place them 
so that no three are on the same line. Have they succeeded here? Yes, these students have found a solution, and no three of those towers lie on the same line. Is it the only solution? No, here's another one. And these students have found yet another solution. The unsolved problem of mathematics connected to this little problem is to think what happens with really big cities and lots of towers. The unsolved problem for grade two is to add as many numbers as possible to these magical hats, starting with one and going up. The only problem is you can't add a number to a hat if it's equal to the sum of two numbers inside already. So can I add the number 10 here? No, because 1 plus 9 is equal to 10. The hat would explode if you added the 10 there. Can you add the number 10 here? No, because 2 plus 8 is equal to 10. What about here? 4 plus 6 is equal to 10. So we have failed at the number 10. This is a great mini competition for your grade 2 class working on addition. How high can they get? The problem is unsolved for five hats and above, but it has been solved for three hats. And uh, it, the, the, actually the problem I like to start on is uh, with two hats. And there the answer is eight. You can get eight numbers into the hats and you fail at nine. This problem was first posed in 1916 by I Say Sure. The unsolved problem for grade three is called the graceful tree conjecture. But rather working with those big names, we're just going to look at a little dragonfly. We're going to add odd consecutive integers to those nodes. There we go. And now we're going to look at even integers, adding those to the connecting lines. So for example, five minus one is four. So on that connecting line, we have to put the number four. 13 minus 11 at the bottom is two. So we have to add the two to that connecting line. Okay, let's do that. There are the even integers and here we've got them placed. Have we succeeded? We succeed if we don't have duplicates. Oh, unfortunately here we've got two twos. So we do have duplicates, so we have not succeeded in solving this problem. How do we solve it? Well, if we switch the 11 and 7, let's see, there. Now we've got all different even integers on those connecting lines. So we've solved the problem. The unsolved problem of mathematics is whether you can always solve these uh, graceful trees no matter how many nodes you start with. I love to give kids the opportunity to design their own uh, board, their own insectoid, uh, but I retain control over how many dots they have and therefore control the complexity of the problem that they're trying to solve. This problem was first posed by Gerhard Ringel in 1967. And this was a colorful character. He was a butterfly collector as well as being a great mathematician. The unsolved problem for grade four is from 1937. I like to set it with a Greek mythology theme. You remember that Daedalus and Icarus are imprisoned on a high tower. And they're about to fly off, but the night before they fly off, they have a mathematical dream, both of them. And Icarus's dream, uh, he has rocks and he paints numbers on them and he throws them off the tower. So, for example, if the rock has a three on it, then three is odd, so he triples it and adds one. That would make ten. 10 is even, so then he halves it, that would make 5. 5 is odd, triple it, add 1, that would give 16. And 16 even, that gives 8, 4, 2, 1. Splash into the sea, so the rock is destroyed. Um, the question is, uh, is there any rock that Icarus can throw in his dream 
so that it doesn't end up crashing into the sea? The same night, Daedalus has a dream, and in Daedalus's dream, he has rocks as well, and he throws them off the tower. The three is odd. Triple it and subtract one, you get eight. Eight goes to four, four goes to two, and two goes to one. So again, the question, can Daedalus somehow find a rock that doesn't crash into the sea? These two problems are so close to each other, and yet one of them is an unsolved problem of mathematics, and the other one is easily solved by every single grade four classroom. I'm not going to tell you which is which. Uh, maybe I will. Okay, it's the Daedalus character that can get out of this thorny situation. And he can do so by choosing a rock and putting the number 40 on it, for example. And that does not end up crashing into the sea, but ends up in this cycle, 2010, 5, 14, 7. It's not the only cycle that Daedalus can get out of this thorny situation with. And an interesting problem for your top students is to ask them where all numbers under 20 end up. Most will end up at 1 or in this cycle. But the number 17 is different. Number 17 will end up in this humongous cycle. Lothar Kolatz posed this problem in 1937, and it's still an unsolved problem, and it belongs in every grade 4 classroom learning multiplication. The unsolved problem for grade 5 is to play the game Perudo, or Liar's Dice, really, really well. In this game, teams roll five dice, and they have to bid. So, for example, the first bid might be, I think that there are at least three fives on the table. Let's say that there's three teams playing. And the next could say, oh, I think that there's at least four twos. So each time you have to increase the bid, the next person could the next group could bid four threes. The next person could bid four, five twos. Each time you have to increase the bid or call bluff on the last group. So let's see an example. So the red group is going to go first. They're going to say there are at least two sixes. Now the red group can't see that what the other groups have rolled. So actually there are not two sixes, there's only one, but the red group doesn't know that. The green group then goes next. The green group uh, thinks, okay, there might be two sixes, but look, we've got two fours, so I think that there are at least three fours. That's a higher bid than two sixes. The blue group doesn't have any fours at all, so they think that three fours is a little bit high, so they're going to say bluff. So the blue group was wrong. There were at least three fours. Red had one and green had two, so blue is going to lose a dice. And then it starts again. Prudo belongs in every grade five classroom because it gives students an intuition about probability. The grade six unsolved problem has to do with composite and prime numbers. Red gets to go first, always choosing a composite number. Blue gets to go second, always choosing a prime. Then they each choose, in order, any number they want, so 4 and 40. Blue wins this little game if the two products are the same. 50 times 4 is equal to 5 times 40, so blue wins here. Let's try again. Red choose 403. Blue, after some thinking, chooses 13. Red chooses 2. And blue chooses 62. Ooh, that took some thinking on blue's part, but again, blue has won. Who wins this game if they both play really, really well? Well, let's see. If red chooses a composite number, A times B, then all that blue has to do is to choose A, which is going to be a prime number, and 
then it doesn't matter what red chooses. If they choose, if she chooses C, then all that B, all that blue has to do is to choose B times C. So it looks like blue's going to win all the time. But is this true? Well, if we add a timer, the answer is no. Blue always loses. What the heck is that about? The problem is, is that it is very difficult to factor a composite number that is the product of two large primes. And in fact, that is the basis of internet security. So here we have a rather large composite number that's a product of two primes. Very difficult to figure out what those two primes are. This, uh, this unsolved problem of mathematics is from 1978, and it is to break the RSA cipher. And a million dollars is, is peanuts. If you solve this, you're going to have access to government secrets throughout the whole world and banking information throughout the whole world. You could become a master criminal. So a um, million dollars is peanuts. And here are the three guys responsible. And here they are today. The grade seven problem comes from um, Ron Graham. Egyptian fractions are fractions that have a numerator of one. And you can create solutions to all of these problems by choosing uh, the largest Egyptian fraction possible. So one half is the largest Egyptian fraction for all of these uh, fractions that you see. And now again we choose the largest Egyptian fraction left. So for the bottom three that's a third and for the top ones it's a quarter. Okay, We keep on choosing the largest Egyptian fraction possible. And does this process end? Yes it does. It always ends. And what a beautiful uh, set of problems that you can pose for your kids, getting them to um, always choose the largest Egyptian fraction and solve. For example, 19 over 20. Make sure that you try these problems out before you just haphazardly throw one to the children because some of, the, some of them get truly ugly. Okay, the unsolved problem of mathematics is if we only use denominators that are odd. Again, each step you choose the largest Egyptian fraction that has an odd denominator. Does that process terminate? Nobody knows. Ron Graham not only posed this unsolved problem, but he also became uh, the president of the International Jugglers Association, <laughs> so another multi-talented mathematician. The grade 8 unsolved problem, uh, I needed to develop something that uh, used Pythagoras. And so what is done here is that we have uh, Theseus winding his way through a colonnade on his way to slay the Minotaur, and he suddenly has a mathematical inspiration as he's unwinding Ariadne's string behind him. And he thinks, okay, I want to, each step that I take, I want to make it longer than the step before. That'll give me good luck against the Minotaur. So um, that's uh, an example of a path that he might take, and you can see that each step is longer than the step before. The challenge and the unsolved problem is to find a general solution uh, of this for larger grids. And I guarantee that's a tough, tough, tough problem. <laughs> the purpose of the grade 9 problem is to show off the connection between mathematics and the sciences. This is sometimes lost in high school. So it's important to remind students uh, of that strong connection. This old problem uh, comes to us via astronomy, and the problem is to figure out the paths or the orbits of three bodies uh, giving, given initial conditions. And a, a good problem for the kids to work on is uh, just a two-body two system 
and like uh, the Earth and Moon. The unsolved problem of mathematics for grade 10 is to solve this game called Chomp from 1952. We've got a poisonous little bit of chocolate down there on the bottom left, and each turn you get to eat one circle of chocolate and all circles to the north and to the east of that circle. So there's an example of a move by Yellow. He chomps on 8, 3. Hmm, what will blue do? Blue does this. Yellow does this, blue does that, yellow does that, blue does that, yellow does that, blue does that, and that's not good news for yellow because yellow has to take the poisonous little bit of chocolate and promptly keels over and dies. So this is a good way to just play with Cartesian coordinates um, before you get heavily into it. So it's just a light way to introduce it. And the unsolved problem is who wins for various rectangle starting positions. The grade 11 unsolved problem is to solve this equation. It actually turns out to be really easy to get solutions. For example, 1, 1, 1 is a solution. And you can find other solutions just by fixing for example, x and y is equal, both of them equal to 1, and then solving for z. And you're going to get two different solutions. You're going to get z is equal to 1, and z is equal to 2. And you can keep on fixing uh, two of the solutions and uh, solving for the third using the quadratic equation. And you'll find an infinite number of solutions this way. The unsolved problem of mathematics is to figure out if the numbers that appear uh, are always connected. So for example, all the fives that you see there are connected. It, does five appear anywhere else on this tree-like diagram? The purpose of the grade 12 problem is to link students into the popular culture that celebrates mathematics. And that popular culture is best represented by Sudoku. What is the unsolved problem in Sudoku? The unsolved problem is how many hints are necessary to create a Sudoku problem that has a unique solution. There are tens of thousands of Sudoku with 17 hints, but so far none have been found with just 16 hints. And those are the 13 unsolved problems for which we're looking for a million dollars each, the money to be split between the mathematician who solves it and the most inspirational K-12 teacher.